Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Sonics. This is episode 143 with Dr. Ford. I had a great chat with Dr. Ford and we talked about so many things. Honestly, he has such a holistic approach to music production. You kind of get the whole view of how he produces, mixes, and maintains his business in this episode. Honestly, there are nuggets of wisdom from every aspect of the production process here, so tons of lessons for you guys. Uh, He talks about keeping in mind if the fix is constant or momentary, so something like whether you would use regular EQ or dynamic EQ, for example. We talk about mixing with the center and the sides in mind and how to use mid-side processing, why dual mono is so important, and how he uses parallel compression. We talk about vocal textures, putting in the reps to perfect the process, Um, how a trip to mix with the masters with Jack Joseph Puig really changed the game for him and had a massive impact on his approach to record making, the rule of threes, the golden ratio, uh, lessons learned from his mom's real estate business. Really, this is just, there's just so much in here. So I think you're going to love this conversation. So with all that to say, here's my conversation with Dr. Ford coming up right here on Secret Sonics. Hey everyone. If you're anything like me, you often find yourself looking for business insight in podcasts. And I'm sure many of you are also into meditation and reflection to help better understand yourself. Former guest of the show, Carl Bonner, decided to launch a podcast that brings these two elements together. It's a series of guided self-reflection exercises, but specifically for freelance creatives like you and me, focusing on the struggles we face as we try to grow our businesses, while also finding more happiness in the work that we do. It's called Thanks for Thinking. It's definitely an unusual format, but if you want to grow your self-awareness, find deeper career satisfaction, and make more money, then I think this podcast might be for you. Experience it for yourself and click the link in the show notes below. You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. And welcome back to Secret Sonics. I'm your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford is an award-winning and chart-topping music producer, mixer, and composer based out of Nashville, Tennessee. I found Dr. Ford years ago on a podcast episode of Recording Studio Rockstars, which I thought was great. And I finally reached out to see if he'd come on the show, which he graciously agreed to do. So with all that to say, uh, welcome to Secret Sonics, Doc. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, absolutely. Apologies. We had, we had a little technical issues here trying to get us started. I apologize about yeah, that. Yeah, no worries. It's all it's all good. Technica- technical issues is part of the course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and here we are once here again. We are. So so why don't you uh, tell the audience a little bit about your origin story, which you've kind of already told me a bit about. I'd love for the audience to hear it. And I'm sure, although you've said it probably on other <laughs> podcasts, no, it would be great to- We too. said it twice today. <laughs> yeah, we said it. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Give us the TLDR of how you became Dr. Ford. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm a huge uh, music education person. So I just want to uh, say that, you know, I, I believe in, in music education in public schools. And so- I got my start in band, in in school band playing drums. I played drums in the orchestra and in the jazz band and pep band all through uh, fourth grade through high school. And then uh, my mom owned a ballet store growing up. So I used to take uh, tap and jazz and ballet classes up through middle school just as it's just what you did when you're in my family. So I'm the youngest of four and the whole family plays instruments and sings and dances. And it's just what my par- my parents kind of did with us. And my grandmother... Uh, may she rest in peace. She loved the old black and white movies. Uh, just loved them all so much. And so growing up, I used to watch um, Gene Kelly and like like Singing in the Rain was um, one mm-hmm. of my favorite movies of all time. Well, growing up and I'd go to my grandmother's house and she'd put on Singing in the Rain and I'd sing and dance around. And that was like elementary school for me was just those uh, those old movies, the black and white musicals and uh, – Uh, and then of course they went to color, but yeah, that was what I grew up doing and then did musical theater myself, um, all through like every summer and all through high school. And then eventually I decided I wanted to be a DJ and spin house music, uh, at local raves and, uh, all that. I grew up just outside of San Francisco. So that was the scene in the nineties that was super cool. And so I was uh, DJing like kind of mid-level local raves and I was trying to increase my, brand. And so I had this idea that if I learned how to do my own record production singles, white release, white label releases, uh, so DJ singles of house music in the genre that I liked, that I would be a more recognizable and thus more booked DJ. And so 
uh, in 2003, I decided to go back to school and I went to Musicians Institute in Hollywood, California from 2003 to 2006. And I studied audio engineering. I got my AA in music performance with a keyboard focus and then uh, a journeyman certificate. So basically like a year of audio engineering and a focus on uh, being a recording artist. Uh, and at the time I treated myself as the artist, but I had never had really any intention of being a singer or anything like that. So I just wanted to learn how to do it the right way. My stepfather had helped uh, a gal named Lisa. She had worked for him and and they were real tight and uh, sort of uh, he really kind of helped kind of grow her as a realtor. My stepfather is also a broker. Her name was Lisa and she was married to a guy named Ronnie King. And so when I went to Hollywood to go to school in 2003, uh, my stepfather, Michael, called Lisa and said, hey, you know, my stepson's coming down there. Do you think you could introduce him to your husband, Ronnie? So, yes. So I got my first internship at Studio Atlantis being a runner and a janitor. Really, I was like a janitor for four or five months. If it was modern times, I might have filed a complaint against him. But I was an unpaid janitor for three or four months uh, and then a runner. And I used to go get smoothies and food and drugs for <laughs> whoever was uh, – <laughs> I mean, a lot of nothing, nothing serious, but, you know. Uh, for for whatever was happening down there, I would that was just the the studio that I was going to, and then uh, and then Ronnie had brought in some sessions. So he that's how I got the internship. Is that Ronnie was a keyboard session keyboard player. He's a producer. He's a fantastic. So Ronnie King, his his catalog is huge. Ronnie played on a bunch of Tupac stuff, Snoop Dogg stuff. God, that's I think that's the biggest stuff. Is there's a bunch of famous records down there from Tupac and Snoop that Ronnie King played on and a lot of other stuff too. I mean, he's on, he's a, a outcast, not outcast offspring. So Ronnie uh, was a off- keyboard. He was a keyboard player for offspring for a while. And I think a bunch of those like Southern California punk rock scene uh, bands down there, he, I mean, Ronnie was all over it. And so whether he was producing or whether he was the keyboard player, Ronnie and his best bud, Richie Rich, who is, uh, there are two Richie Riches in California. There's the Oakland Richie Rich and there's the Los Angeles Richie Rich. And this was the Los Angeles Richie Rich. And uh, so they were like best buds. And so they were just doing sessions and producing artists, independent artists. And so I effectively was their Pro Tools operator. And so mm-hmm. once Ronnie and I met, he goes, well, do you want to, I can get you an internship here at Studio Atlantis. So I did. And this was like right when I got to Los Angeles. So I was super fresh faced. And um, I didn't really learn anything from Studio Atlantis. I was a janitor. When I say that, I, I, mean, I really was a janitor for four months. Mm-hmm. All I did was clean bathrooms and reset billiards balls and that kind of stuff. I wasn't allowed anywhere in the studio, and I didn't even wasn't even allowed to dust any equipment in there. I like literally never got to go in. It was kind of crazy when I think about it, but I was cool with That's it. Insane. You know, that's just how it goes. At one, so I was going to college in the day. And then I would go help Ronnie at night. And that was for three years. That's all I did was um, run Pro Tools sessions for hip hop sessions all over Los Angeles in, from from uh, Pico at the Mint studio. Mm. Uh, there was another one down in um, El Segundo studio down there and uh, got to work with Battle Cat, got to work with um, Big Psych, uh, the, the East Siders, Snoop Dogg's the East Siders, and uh, a lot of cool like independent rap music down there and just sort of being in the trenches cutting my teeth on making hip hop records. Eventually I returned to my roots. So growing up in California, um, I listened to a lot of country music and I remember at the time that people didn't think it was cool. So I uh, side funny side stories. I was on seventh grade trip on the bus and I was listening to Garth Brooks in my headphones and, uh, somebody asked me if they could hear what I was listening to. And I let them hear it. And they were like, what is this? I like it. And they were like, is this alternative? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Cause I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to say I was listening to country music. Cause I, you know, didn't want to get bullied or whatever <laughs> the things we do when we're kids. And so, totally. yeah, I grew up listening to country music. So it's a funny thing that, you know, I believe in, uh, uh, just letting the wind take you sometimes. So to think that I was, you know, doing rap music and band stuff, then end up in country music is funny, but I, I've always loved country music at the end of my college years. My my apartment burned down. That's another story. But basically, a wow. week a week after graduation, I went out with the with the buddies, came home, and my apartment had burnt from the ground up. So I had a first floor back corner, and there was a um, surge protector in the level beneath that caught, and it burned up through my apartment. So 
I was kind of like, whoa, college is over for a weekend now. I guess I have to move. And uh, I was actually really looking forward to a summer of like, like finally kind of getting to work and doing all this cool stuff anyways. And so I had renter's insurance. And so I got a good, uh, a good check from them to kind of replace everything because I had to get everything. And luckily, this keyboard that's right here on my right, my motif, survived. Um, and then my computer survived, but nothing else survived. Like I have very few things from that time period. Uh, everything in my life is kind of, it's, it's kind of nice because I don't have a pack rat thing. I just don't have anything from that time. But all of my childhood things all burnt up. The video games burnt up. The toys burnt up. Like everything that, you know, you take with you. And uh, all my clothes from back then burnt up. That had just happened. And someone was looking for a keyboard player. So they called uh, the school and they're like, hey, we have auditions for a keyboard player for this country band. And I was like, I guess I'll take a shot at it because I got nothing here. So I did and got the gig. And then I flew to Florida that summer, 2006, and uh, was there for the summer playing shows all over Florida with this country band. And then that kind of ended and it wasn't really going anywhere. And um, my sister, Jessica, the number two sibling, I'm the number four sibling. Jessica mm -hmm. had moved to Nashville in 2002, 2003, maybe. And she was vocal coaching, a, a singing coach, and she was doing her own music and she had bought a house in Nashville. And she was like, well, you could come here. So I left uh, November 1st, 2006 and drove 14 hours in a U-Haul with whatever I had left. And uh, Jessica flew down and drove with me and we got to her house in Nashville. And uh, the very next day, I went to Sambuca restaurant in the Gulch here in Nashville to get a job waiting tables. And I met my wife. So <laughs> she came in She wow. came in and sat down next to me at the bar uh, to talk to her friend, the bartender. And we sparked up a conversation as you do. That was that. So uh, you mentioned earlier, you congratulated me on getting married. That's how, that's how we met. So uh -huh. I, it's almost that point where I've been with her longer than I haven't. We're getting close. A few more years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Anyway, well, so that's more or less. That's my, air. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's my origin story. More or less. Uh, oh, I guess, I guess, sorry. I guess the thing I didn't say was, well, I was just going to say the reason I didn't go back to DJing is that as soon as I got in the studio and started making music for real, I started learning what I was doing. My love for, um, and this is a controversial thing. I believe that producers, and I don't mean like the old school producers, and that's not to diss them, but if you're doing a band at once practice where like the whole band comes in and uh, you hit record and it's all live more or less, I don't yeah. really feel that's what modern production is. That's a totally different art form. So modern production, the producer is the recording artist, in my opinion. And I don't believe that is genre specific, whether you program EDM, uh, whether you do country music like I do, I think the producers of modern day are recording artists. And then you have singers who are performing artists. And I think that originally that that designation uh, came because it was expensive. And so to call yourself a recording artist was a, was a distinguished because you actually had something behind you to go record. So that was pretty cool. But in these days, being a quote recording artist doesn't mean that if you're just someone who comes into a studio and sings over a karaoke track, right? So, cause it's just one more calling card you have. What you, what really is amazing is the people that are on stage doing the act. And that, I think that's amazing anyways. And so I've kind of behind the scenes, I kind of think of myself as a recording artist, although I have no interest in singing on a thing. My medium is pro tools, ones and zeros, compressors and EQs are my instrument. And that's, I think the, I think producers are modern recording artists. And so I fell in love with that. And that's kind of where I am now. It's like the creation. It's the act of creating something out of nothing. Yeah. Cause it's like, I think the title producer is kind of antiquated anyways. It's like, okay, the job of the producer is to produce a product. Well, does that right. really encompass what we do every day? Yeah. Anybody can put a product together. Can you, can, are you putting art forward that is both scientifically sound as an audio engineered piece of data? You know, the thing that we do, is it technically, technically great? And is it artistically great? And did you add your soul to it? And is there art that goes beyond? And I think that that's why we have these superhero mixers that we love because they're adding Yes, a standard of of audio excellence, but then also they have their soul and flavor in every mix they do. It's like, oh, it sounds like a Chris Lord algae mix. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
that he's a recording artist in that, or I should say he's a mixing artist in that way would probably be the best way to say it, right? Although he's an excellent producer if you've ever heard anything he's done. I don't think I've heard any, I, I mean, maybe I haven't, just don't know it. But yeah. but yeah, like everybody who gets involved in a record imparts some of them 